This video contains spoilers for Resident Evil Revelations. You have been warned. If you've seen my videos before, you'll know that I'm a big fan of Resident Evil. But even with that, there's plenty of stuff I've managed to miss. Last year, I made a video about completing the original Resident Evil for the first time. Because the first RE game I got as a kid on the PlayStation was RE2. And even by comparison to its immediate sequel, the first game felt clunky enough that I struggled to go back and play it. Yes! <laughs> in your dead face, you prick. I've also been streaming the Resident Evil remake, because although I've completed the game as Jill, I've yet to do so as Chris. So I've fixed that. Likewise, the Resident Evil Revelations games passed me by. One big reason for that is that I never had a Nintendo 3DS, and when it first released, 10 years ago tomorrow, if you're watching this on the day it comes out, it was exclusive to the DS. By the time it came to PS3, Xbox 360, Wii U and PC over a year later, my gaming had largely dropped off because of other things consuming my time. And it wouldn't be until the pandemic hit in 2020 that I'd rediscover my love of video games. However, what this does mean is that I've been able to discover the game for the first time and make this video in time for its 10th birthday. Resident Evil Revelations was directed by Koshi Nakanishi, a game designer for Resident Evil 5. Nakanishi believed that fear is the root and the core of the Resident Evil series, and the original game was the first title which I saw the potential for games to be frightening. Which is why, with bringing the game to the 3DS, he says, We never had the attitude that it was just a handheld game, compared to the console entries in the series, so we didn't hold back in terms of volume and depth of content. When we were first experimenting with the 3D capabilities of the Nintendo 3DS, we were very excited we saw the chance to produce a tense, scary experience with a realistic atmosphere that could make players feel like there could be something lurking around every corner. This is reflected in the level design of the game, particularly the main ship-based setting with its narrow corridors and restricted field of view. Playing through the PS4 port of the game, Revelations plays almost like a hybrid of Resident Evil 5 and 6, with the latter's independently controlled camera, but a lot of the design sensibilities of the former. However, there are a lot of moments throughout where it feels like an older Resident Evil title. It's still a lot more action oriented than the Raccoon City era of the games. Many of the boss fights are chaotic scrambles. Pretty much every area has a set of enemies and most of them respawn when you come back. Meaning that there's little risk of empty, lonely corridors as you might experience in the Spencer Mansion. What backtracking there is comes from the level leading you back the way you came in a following chapter once an objective is complete, rather than through exploration. As such, it's fair to say that this is still action horror rather than survival horror. But horror is definitely a key ingredient of the game, particularly early on and when you venture into unexplored areas and face new threats. Before we get too deep into that though, let's talk about the story. The game is set in 2005, one year after the events of Resident Evil 4, but also one year after the Terra Grigia Panic. The city of Terra Grigia, a floating city in the Mediterranean Sea, was attacked by the bioterrorist organization Il Veltro. The US's Federal Bioterrorism Commission assumed control of the situation as the premier anti-bioterrorism organization. The Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, despite its expanded status and remit in Resident Evil 5 and 6, is at this point just an NGO and allowed one observer to the situation. Its director, Clive O'Brien. Deciding that the situation is unsalvageable, the FBC orders the city destroyed and accomplish this with a focused laser from solar-powered satellites. Starting the game proper, we open on BSAA agents Jill Valentine and Parker Luciani boarding the abandoned Queen Zenobia cruise liner in the Mediterranean. This was the last known location of agents Chris Redfield and Jessica Sherowat, who have since dropped off the radar whilst hunting for Il Veltro. The ship is without power and filled with bioweapons called ooze. As well as being able to climb through vents and floor grates to attack, their mouths contain a strange tube which latches onto their victims in order to suck out their essence. As the game goes on we will meet many more of these, including some with pincers, 
some who can fire sharp projectiles, and some who just swell up and explode. Navigating through these creatures, Jill and Parker find Chris seemingly detained in a cell. Except that it isn't. Someone has gone to the trouble of constructing a realistic doll of him as the bait for a trap. The captor uses knockout gas on them before promising to show them the truth. We then discover Chris and Jessica in the mountains, heading towards an airport base. On the way, they witness a crash and fight off a whole bunch of mutated dogs, but they discover Il Veltro's apparent hideout. O'Brien then informs them that Jill and Parker have fallen off the grid, and the pair retreat to pursue their last known location. Waking up in a stately bedroom without weapons, Jill acquires a screwdriver as a means of opening the door. She is the master of unlocking, after all, and does a lot of dodging until she can reunite with Parker and they can recover their equipment. They also discover that the cruise liner's layout, decor and more were based off a design by Spencer Mansion architect George Trevor before he went missing. Always a good sign. Getting to the bridge to change course, Jill and Parker find the terminal controls destroyed. Then their tugboat with which they boarded explodes. Immediately after, they are attacked by a mysterious man who apparently likes to style his bright red hair in such a manner as to invoke murderous clowns. We then flash back to the Terragrija Panic, where the attacker is revealed to be an FBC cadet who has at some point been seriously injured. Parker and Jessica are at this point also FBC agents. Their director, Morgan Lansdale, about the most sinister looking and sounding old man you've ever seen, announces that they will be leaving before O'Brien confronts him about the city's destruction. After which, Parker and Jessica make their way out of the city, putting a swathe through hordes of hunters on the way. Back in the present, the cadet, Raymond Vesta, refuses to say why the FBC is on the ship. They leave him and fight their way to the emergency communication room. Raymond beats them there, however, and the cables on the comm panel have been torn out. We then see a broadcast of the head of Il Veltro, Jack Norman, declaring his intent to infect the seas with the T Abyss virus. <laughs> He's turning guppies in a jaw! Shh, quiet. As Chris and Jessica say to the Mediterranean for the ship, Gil and Parker's only hope now is to restore the main power. To do this, they need to get the lift key off Raymond's partner, Rachel. It turns out that you saw her getting eaten earlier, and now you need to loot her corpse. But, this being Resident Evil, you need to stop it moving first. This allows Jill and Parker to take the lift down into the bilge. Straight into the depths of hell. Meanwhile, back in the mountains, the BSAA's Keith Lumley and Quinn Ketchum are investigating the airport. They find evidence of foul play and an encrypted key they can use to say to the crashed plane's computers. Jill and Parker restore power, only for the room they're in to flood. As they desperately scramble to stay alive, Chris and Jessica land and fight their way through the same path to reach that room, which they find dry and empty. It's then revealed that they have found the Queen Zenobia's sister ship, the Queen Semiramis. Luckily, Jill and Parker escape on their own and finally make it to the antenna at the top of the ship to call for help. It may be too late, however, as the FBC has decided to use the solar laser that destroyed Terra Grigia to take out the ship. O'Brien cannot rescue them in time. Their only hope is to launch a drone and deploy chaff to disrupt the satellite's targeting systems. They manage this just in the nick of time. However, the ship is flooded in the process and sinking. Gill and Parker manage to escape what is now a literal sunken maze, only to be confronted by a Veltro terrorist in the ship's casino. At the same time, Chris and Jessica board the ship after a confrontation with the giant sea monster and reach the casino in time for Jessica to shoot the terrorist just as he was about to reveal the truth. The terrorist turns out to be not the Veltro leader, but Raymond, who whispers something to Parker before seemingly dying. Chris and Jill then go to neutralise the virus, whilst Parker and Jessica head to the bridge. In the meantime, back at the airport, Ethan Quint discover that the return of Veltro was in fact orchestrated by O'Brien himself, which he acknowledges. It turns out that this ruse was all in aid of drawing out Lansdale and the FBC, whom he suspects of foul play around Terra As Keith and Quint are trying to get the data to confirm this, the airport is bombed and it looks like they died, failing to transfer the necessary intel. Lansdale's role is also discovered by Jill and Chris, 
as he does a supervillain reveal on the giant screens in the virus room. He feels they will no longer be a bother as his spy Jessica is about to destroy the ship. She is almost foiled by Raymond, who is somehow still alive, except that Parker doesn't know who to trust and so in the moment allows himself to get shot to save Raymond, but also gives Jessica space to trigger the destruct. This leads to Jill and Chris narrowly escaping, unfortunately not being able to save a wounded Parker in the process and having to take on the giant sea creature now consuming the ship. O'Brien reveals that Raymond was working for him, having suspected Lansdale since Terra Grigia, but their operation may come to naught as they still don't have the final incriminating evidence. Taking no chances, Lansdale destroys the Queen Semiramis alongside the Zenobia and has the FBC raid the BSAA to arrest O'Brien for working with Veltro. There's only one place that Jill and Chris can find the proof to take down Lansdale now. The third ship, the Queen Dido, sunken in the ruins of Terra Grigia. There, they find that Veltro leader Jack Norman is still alive, infected with the T-Abyss virus, and has killed the FBC agents sent to recover the evidence for Lansdale. Gil and Chris have to take him down to recover his footage, but before they can, he transforms into a tyrant for the final battle. I can die. After this, the pair broadcast the evidence, leading to Lansdale's arrest and the shutdown of the FBC. It's not likely you'll be wriggling out of this one. We learn that this leads to the BSAA being restructured under the remit of the UN into the organization we know in RE5 and 6. O'Brien steps down as director but remains an advisor, whilst it turns out that Parker, Keith and Quint are all actually still alive. Parker was rescued by Raymond, who in turn is revealed in a stinger scene as some sort of triple agent, delivering a sample of the T-Abyss to Jessica. There are clearly some facets of the story that make no sense. The final scene renders most of Raymond and Jessica's actions completely illogical, raising far more questions than likely have coherent answers. O'Brien's conspiracy to catch Lansdale on the whole makes sense, but there's no reason for him to have faked Chris's capture with a dummy, or had Raymond remove Jill and Parker's weapons and lock them up. This put the characters in peril for gameplay, or had no dramatic consequences on the plot itself. With that said, Having completed this game for the first time, this definitely adds a lot to the Resident Evil canon. Not only do we see the origins of the BSAA and some further adventures with Chris and Jill, but it adds further depth to the politics and corruption that underpin the struggle against bioterrorism. In my video about how RE9 could bring back characters like Jill and Claire, I talked about the kind of deep story that the corruption of the BSAA could allow for. Resident Evil Revelation serves as proof that this kind of complex conspiratorial plot where characters operate in Shades of Grey is well suited to the franchise, and callbacks to what became of the FBC serve as an important lesson the BSAA is refusing to heed. As I said earlier in the video, the gameplay is very much in the vein of RE5 and 6. This on the whole works well with the atmosphere Nakanishi was aiming for in the claustrophobic spaces of the ship. I also like the fact that, unlike RE5 and 6, combat in a lot of the game is once more optional and more than once it made far more sense for me to run through the doors than stand and fight. Where combat was unavoidable, it was a mixed bag. The dodge mechanic in the game is far less polished than that found in the RE3 remake, meaning that I successfully did it by accident far more than by design. It's also worth noting that it took me far longer than I want to admit to figure out that you have to dodge right in front of the TV in order to take out the ooze that attacks when you have no weapons. The inability to sprint, which works well for the moments in tight spaces where you don't know what's around the corner, lets down the combat where you're in an area with multiple enemies and trying to find the spaces to fire off shots. It's like putting RE2 remakes Leon or Claire in an RE6 chaotic horde scenario, and it doesn't always feel fun. The Skag dead boss was a massive pain in the arse every time I encountered them, and the combination of a bullet sponge who could only one hit kill with loads of smaller enemies that just got in the way felt very cheap at times. Though I only got close to full-on raging when facing Norman. His tendency to occasionally appear at inconvenient angles beyond my field of view might be less annoying if his hand slam didn't have so absurdly large a range. His occasional refusal to stagger even when I hit his weak spot and still whack me down just made that worse. 
and the aesthetics of Chris standing in the corner, shooting impotently, while the monster single-mindedly focused on Jill so you couldn't even use distraction as a tactic, made me feel relieved when that fight was over and never wanting to do it again. On the other hand, the iconic Hunter feels like one of the more minor enemies in this game, going down relatively easy. Which isn't a complaint per se, but it's just a strange contrast to the earliest games. Despite all that, it was very much fun to play through on the whole, and I'm glad I got it. It's always good to get more of Jill and Chris. Parker was also a good addition to the cast, though his eventual survival kind of undermined the impact of his sacrifice for the main characters. Overall, the plot lands well, and I enjoyed the twists. I could do without Jessica, Keith and Quint, but they were a minor irritation, so I won't go off on one here. Even about Jessica's choice to enter combat in a single trouser leg, wearing a pant instead of pants, if you will. Bizarre. Later this year, in October, we'll see another Resident Evil 10th anniversary, this one for RE6. That game was the point at which the franchise was deemed by many to have completely gone off the rails, until the course correction that came with RE7. In all that, Resident Evil Revelations is often overlooked and overshadowed. But this is a worthy entry to the series which whilst far from perfect does a better job than RE6 in balancing action with horror and creating a game that, despite being a Resident Evil game that is very definitely of its time, still finds ways to call back to the atmosphere and lore of the most iconic and, dare I say, best games of the franchise. If you've not played Revelations yet, what better time than the 10th anniversary to pick it up? Let me know in the comments whether you've played Revelations, or if you're planning to, and what you thought. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more Resident Evil content. See you next time.